sir, and really appreciate it on Facebook and other emails that we received during uh, time back and forth to Texas. Really glad to be here with you guys today. Love that song, and uh, I love to sing that song, but I love the spirit of that song. Here, here's what that song is saying, and I, I guarantee you, if you don't understand it, you just ask B, because B will tell you, or Tom and Brenda will tell you. It's, it's celebrating and asking, I want something to take control of me other than me. I've seen what I do with my life, and it's not pretty. And so I believe, not only do I believe the Spirit exists, but I want the Spirit to move and take control of me. Sometimes I might be embarrassed by the difference in my life, but I'm telling you what, Donna, there's going to be a difference. There's going to be a difference because I've seen what the world makes out of people, and I don't plan to be like that. So we're going we're gonna to delve into the Spirit in a few minutes, but uh, being that this is a special day down with our fall festival, we're going to do some special things for our special day. Um, in, in terms of this church, so when we, Dana, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, so the Holy Spirit, yeah, gets a hold of you and Brian, and it changes you, and it transforms you, but sometimes the Spirit gets a hold of a whole entity, like a church. And so you begin to see expressions. And so you would say, well, there's a marker here. So if you talk to Jack, Jack can say, here's some distinctive differences in the way this church expresses its faith in Jesus over generations. Because Jack has gotten the blessing to see that. And, and, and it's growing. Maybe it's maturing. But these aren't things we thought of. This is what God has presented us with based on our calling and our purpose and we, we see the Spirit moving in a way. And one of the things that happened in this church in the last few, last decade, last few years, is transforming the church to be focused on the community. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a worldwide impact with this church. There is a uh, statewide, nationwide impact, and we could go into that. There are things going on in the city with dry bones, larger metro area. But then there is Green Mountain. This is the neighborhood this church is in. So the Spirit is moving this church to be dynamic, kingdom-advancing force all over the world, in the state, but in this neighborhood. And so one of the partners God has blessed us with working in this neighborhood has been Green Mountain Elementary School. We've had the banner on the back there uh, tracking the foothills. Green Mountain High School Foothills Elementary School. So Foothills Elementary School has been a massive partner for us, moved us, challenged us, transformed us as we followed the Spirit in this neighborhood. Um, and so with us today, special guest, local neighborhood celebrity, is Principal Dr. Sue Borsick. She's going to come up and talk with, us, talk with me this morning. So Sue, come on up. Give her a hand this morning. Escorted by uh, Gary Southern, so uh, Sue's going to don a microphone and the uh, pallid uh, interview spot here with me this morning. And so, uh, so we, we know you're a principal and all that kind of stuff, but uh, introduce yourself to us, uh, Sue. If, if you, there's the Dr. Borzik part and there's the Sue grandma part, so kind of give us, give us a picture of Sue. If you were going to tell us a little bit about yourself, who, who is Dr. Sue Borzik? Well, I am the principal of Foothills Elementary, but that being said, that's a pretty lofty title for the work that we do over there because it really does um, it represent a, a valent teamwork, and that's kind of how I approach my life away from school as well. Um, I do have two kids, two grown kids and six grandkids, so they keep me grounded in the work that we do as a community and as a school, and that helps me focus on what the true purpose of what I do is, and so... Being very family connected, I am, and I have a very um, large extended family. I'm one of six kids. And so it does help to uh, bring that community feel to everything that I do. That's great. So, Sue, let's kind of go back in time a little bit. Somewhere around the fall of 2011, we got connected. And so there, there's a way I like to tell the story, which we all know is right. But... Um, <laughs> There's your experience, so that, you know, we, we, uh, we connected, uh, we met that fall of 2011, uh, you know, just kind of describe 
meeting me, becoming aware of the church on the hill? Were there any hesitations? What was it like when, when we first connected and I invited you to the pastors, the local pastors meeting? Kind of tell your version of the story of meeting me and finding out about the church and making that connection. Well, really, my story is right. But um, <laughs> in, in any case, when I first became the principal at Foothills, and this would have been about four years ago, a little over four years ago, um, they always referred to this church as the church on the hill. And I, okay, all right, the church on the hill. I got to go up and see this church on the hill one day and kind of get my bearings. But that's really um, how people referred to it. So it was interesting when Reg invited us to this meeting because he invited all these principals to come and talk about community, talk about our needs. And I thought, well, as an elementary principal, I got lots of needs. Um, you know, I don't know that he really wants to hear all of them. But, you know, back when I was growing up, my father always said and had always taught us, if you want something, you have to be persistent, sometimes to the point of being annoying, but you've got to be persistent in order to achieve some of your goals. So at this meeting, Reg was asking us, you know, I met Reg, and I thought, well, this is a, a very nice gentleman. You know, I'll have to explore this a little bit more. But I thought, you know, he's just going to come, and, you know, it's going to kind of be the same old, same old, the same kinds of things that we've already witnessed in communities that are wonderfully helpful but don't necessarily make a difference um, or a, a large impactful difference. So I, I kind of sat through this thinking, okay, well. And so he asked us what we needed, and I kept thinking, you know, in order to really improve the experience that kids have at Foothills, we've got to improve our school not only from the inside out, but from the outside in. We've got to make it a very attractive place for kids to come, because kids have that perception of wanting to go to a neat, cool school. So our field, as you well know, was kind of in poor shape, and our kids couldn't run and play and engage. We played softball in the gym. Not much fun, I have to say. And so um, I kept telling Reg, I need this field, I need this field. And I kind of felt like he was going, yeah, Sue, yeah, Sue, whatever. And so I thought, persistence, persistence. I need to be persistent with Reg. He may think I'm annoying, but I need to be persistent. And so um, that really sparked up this relationship and this kind of um, journey that we've been on, and it's been a wonderful, wonderful journey. So I guess if I have somebody to think, it's not only Reg, but it's my father who told me persistence is sometimes a good thing. It's good, it's good. I, I, I like that story of persistence, and I think a lot of us can tell that story of persistence. That may be the theme of what God has done in a lot of our lives. We wouldn't, most of us wouldn't be here if somebody hadn't been persistent with us, and so uh, I, I like that. That that really fits with who we are as a church. Well, so uh, a bunch of our folks are going to be down at school today, a lot of them for the first time. Uh, we do have a lot of veterans that, uh, like Mike Graves that was up and Gary and others that have been tutors, and there's been many of us that have served in different ways, but there's going to be a lot of folks. I've encouraged the membership just to come down today and just get to know people, just wander around and talk and make friends with people um, at school, so especially for some of these new folks that are coming down today, if you could give us some coaching tips. I know when we first started our connection, there was, hey, you know, what's, what's Reg up to? Is this a proselytizing adventure? Uh, if you were going to give us some coaching tips, uh, do's and don'ts, ways to approach parents, things that we're going to experience today down at, at uh, your school, what would be some things you would want to prepare us for maybe as a church? Well, I think, um, you know, one of the things that this community um, is really looking for and the a way to strengthen the community is just to, you know, God has always spoken to us about treating other people the way we would want to be treated, to put others before we put ourselves, to really give in the, in the most authentic kind of way. And that's really what I think the people at Foothills are looking for is just, and, and they need that to be modeled for them too, um, is what does it look like um, in a Christian way to really give from the bottom of our heart because we want to give, not because somebody has put us up to give or not because, um, you know, we're supposed to be there. It's really we, we want to strengthen our community, we want to be a part of the community. Uh, as I think back, there's not one thing that happens in this community that doesn't have a faith-based component, an education component, a city and government component, a business component. We need to all work together to strengthen the community. And this has been Reg's vision from day one, which is really kind of why I've jumped on his bandwagon, because I truly believe that 
every piece of this is a huge part in keeping communities strong. So as you're coming down to Foothills, and we welcome you wholeheartedly with open arms, you are no longer referred to as the Church on the Hill, by the way. You are, you actually have a name, and people know that this is like we're Church of Christ, and that the people that are coming down represent your wonderful community up here. And it's been an amazing transformation um, just in the families and, and some of the things that we've seen gone on, go on at our school in terms of family connections, families wanting to be involved. And I truly believe that's because they have seen you model that kind of work when you're down by our school. And so um, if you do, you know, be yourselves and because you are one, a wonderful group of people and that's really who we want to right. embrace. I, lo I love that. I, you know, I there are several things that are really powerful about this church, and you've really nailed it. I can always bank on this church being welcoming, being loving, and treating people uh, in, in generous ways. This, uh, it, it has been a blast and a blessing to be a part of a church that is so real, and, and you, you can't be a non-connected visitor here for long. People want to connect with you. Well, um, kind of parting shot, if you were going to just share a word uh, with this church today, a challenge or an encouragement, just um, free reign on the mic, Sue, uh, what would be, knowing that you are a teacher at heart, uh, if you were going to uh, guide us, uh, bless us, share something with us, challenge greater vision, what would be your parting word today to Lakewood Church of Christ? Well, you know what? I don't know that I can that, that I can give you any more wonderful wisdom and words of of uh, deep thought than Reg probably already gives you on a on a weekly basis, daily basis up here. Um, but I can tell you that from the bottom of our hearts in representing Foothills, we want to thank all of you. We want to thank you for not only embracing us, embracing the community spirit. Um, helping us become the best school that we can be, making sure that we provide all of our community members and students with the same opportunities that they would have in any other community. Um, it's just amazing what you all do. And so I really need to, to thank you. And this comes from the bottom of my heart. The appreciation is wholeheartedly felt amongst in my entire staff. So. Um, they continue to, to partner with us to do the things that we want to do to make all of our celebrations community celebrations, not the celebrations of a church or a, or a government or a business or a school, but rather let's embrace the entire community when we celebrate because that's, that's the power of this community. Love it. That's fantastic. Well, we're going to uh, take a little fellowship break and uh, love on each other and uh, I want you to, uh, again, celebrate Sue and talk to her for just a few minutes, and then I'll call you back when we're ready to start the official sermon time. So give her a hand, and let's uh, stand up. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. That's a good idea. Stay. Good Tommy. Good seeing you, man. tired. Thank you very much.
all the way from the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. It's to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. All right, guys. Uh, there is a purple sheet that's uh, in your bulletin that will uh, guide you for sermon notes this morning. We're going to be John 14 and then in the book of Ephesians. So for the next seven weeks, and you've got the calendar in your, uh, on your purple sheet there, we're going to be, uh, we're going to be engaged in a study of the Holy Spirit from the book of Ephesians. It may seem like an interesting or different place to study the Holy Spirit. I'm calling the series 518, Full to Overflowing, and that's the, the promise, the call, the challenge of the apostle in Ephesians 518. And I want us to be focused on that passage, 518, and I want us to be focused on that challenge or that promise to be full to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. So full to overflowing. Well, what does that mean? What does that mean, Mary, to be full to overflowing with the Holy Spirit? Well, today we're going to start with the promise, full to overflowing with God's promises. That promise comes with presence. We're going to walk through our belonging, full to overflowing with a sense of belonging. We're connected. Strength, unity, holiness, grace, God's power, full to overflowing. Full to overflowing with the power of God. But today, full to overflowing, the spirit of promise. Let's pray, and then we'll spend some time in John 14. Lord, pray that you would open up this word to us today. And that we would grow in our confidence, your promise. That that promise would be more than words or things that we memorize. It would define us, captivate us, be our identity. That we could feel it and be changed by your promises. Pray this today in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So when you look at the Holy Spirit itself, Joel, the Holy Spirit himself was a promise. The Holy Spirit was a promise. So it's, it's appropriate that we talk about st the study of the Holy Spirit first as a promise. I know there's a lot of things about the Holy Spirit that people get excited about and talk about. But the very first mention of the Spirit, the age of Christ, was as a promise in John chapter 14. The setting of John 14 and that teaching of Jesus is real important, Nita. Number one, in, in John 13, Jesus predicts that he's going to be betrayed. And he's going to be betrayed by one of his disciples. Can you imagine? You've been following Jesus for three years, and Jesus predicts one of you guys, one of my closest followers, is going to betray me. And then, on top of that, if that's not enough, Glenn, he goes, and you know what? Peter, the leader, he's going to deny me tonight. He's going to deny that he even knows me. Can you imagine how shaken the rest of the disciples were? Number one, somebody's going to betray me. Number two, the leader, the strongest, most courageous disciple is going to deny Jesus. And then number three, Jesus says this, Jen. And on top of all that, I'm leaving and you cannot go with me. They've left everything to follow Jesus, Bob. And, and, and constantly for three years, follow me, follow me. And now, Tony, he says, I'm leaving and you can't go with me. It would be impossible to exaggerate how devastating these predictions of Jesus were to the disciples. And then he says this, verse 12. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done. And even greater works because I'm going to be with the father you can ask for anything in my name and I'll do it so that the son may bring glory to the father yes ask me for anything in my name and I'll do it so Mark if the disciples weren't already freaked out this statement here ought to pretty well do it okay so 
You've completely pulled the rug out from underneath us, and now you're telling us, okay, Mark, here's what I want you to do. I want you to just go do everything you've seen me do. Right. Everything you've done and more, and you know what? An unlimited divine resource is going to be given to you to accomplish this. What? How? I, I, I mean, how? All I'm conscious of is my failures, my weakness, my limitations. How is this, how is this even conceivable? I mean, what? You're going to give me an impossible mission? How, would, how, how could I do that? Verse 15. If you love me, obey my commands, and I will ask the Father. He will give you an advocate. That will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him, doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. So that word advocate, or if you're reading from the New International Version, it says counselor. Advocate, counselor. What does that mean? Here's what that means, Mary. If you looked at the exact translation, what that word means is comfort her. So Mary is studying therapy. And one of the things, the therapist is listening to your story about your struggles, but the way you listen is to promote comfort. The way you counsel brings comfort. So the Holy Spirit, the promised Holy Spirit has come to give you a sense of peace and comfort. When the Holy Spirit is working in us, in the Word, in our community, we get anchored again, presence of God, peace of God, the comfort of God. The Holy Spirit is never going to leave us, Jesus promises. God's promise, God's presence is promised to us all. Verse 23, all who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we, and we will come and make our home with each of them. If that's not underlined in your Bible, let me encourage you to, and we will come and make our home with them. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me, and remember, my words are not my own. What, what I am telling you is from the Father who sent me. I am telling you these things now while I am still with you. But when the Father sends the advocate, the comforter, as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and remind you of everything I've told you. I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. Whoa. So don't be troubled or afraid. The Holy Spirit is promised to Christ's disciples. He'll teach us. He'll remind us of, of Christ's words. He'll, he'll bring supernatural peace, an ability, a supernatural ability to resist fear. He brings peace. He brings a presence that the world can't give. So Recently, my family and I, we were in Texas twice. On trip number one, we went to Abilene and then we went to Dallas, and we spent several days with my mom and my family. Now, my father died in 1983. 1985, my mom started dating this widower. His name was Charlie Thornton. And Charlie was very different than my dad, kind of a farmer kind of guy, had this big garden. Charlie's son, Wes, had been one of my best friends in college. We'd actually sat together every day in chapel. So Wes and I thought it was pretty cool that his dad and my mom were dating. In 1991, I got the uh, honor of officiating my mother's wedding to Charlie. So it was, it was pretty cool. That's Charlie there, and then there's a picture you can't really see of Charlie and my mom sitting on the back deck at our house. They had both experienced 
the sorrow of being alone. Charlie's wife had been killed in a car accident almost a year to the day that my father had died. And together, they got a second chance at love and companionship. Presence. Presence. To be in the presence of someone who loves you. To be with someone that would rather be with you than anybody else in the world. Man, there is nothing like that feeling. Nothing like that. So the Holy Spirit, Jesus says the Holy Spirit brings us God's presence. And those of you that are gifted and blessed to know that experience, that feeling of love companionship, you know, there's a weird and unusual peace that comes in the presence of someone who loves you, chooses you. I want to be with you. We don't have to do anything. We don't have to say anything. We don't have to go anywhere. I just want to be with you. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. So in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul picks up this same spirit, and he issues a promise to the Ephesian Christians. Now, many years had passed since the promise of Jesus to the disciples in John 14. And so here's this church, kind of like this church. We live in a society that, in many ways, has abandoned the principles of God, really kind of lives for themselves, worships weird stuff, gets caught up in all kinds of intrigue, gossip, rumors. It's like the only news is bad news. That was Ephesus. And in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul starts this letter to these Ephesian Christians. They're trying to, they're trying to live out everything about Jesus. How, how am I supposed to live? Uh, my sins are washed away. I'm trying to live. What's this supposed to look like? Ephesians 1 verse 3. Paul writes, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us. That's, that's real important. Loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. What a promise. This is what he wanted to do, and he gave him, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he's poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. God has now revealed to us his mysterious plan regarding Christ a plan to fulfill his own good pleasure. And this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received, we have received an inheritance from God. For he chose us in advance and he makes everything work out according to his plan. God's purpose was that we Jews who were the first to trust in Jesus would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles have all also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. The, the Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so that we would praise and glorify him. And so Paul just keeps using these same word pictures of belonging and connection and presence and relationship and forgiveness and grace and promise and love and inheritance to come and inheritance we receive now. You believed, 
You accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. You were baptized, and so you've been identified. You've been sealed. You are now grafted in, just like, just like I got a new dad. I got adopted in, so to speak. Now, I didn't get my name changed, but Charlie treated me as if I was his own son. Do you know how that feels? Do you know how it feels to have some undone stuff with your blood father and then have your second dad slowly unwind the wounds and bring the blessing your first dad couldn't bring? Paul promises that the Holy Spirit works to affirm in us the fact, the feeling of our connection to God. This is, this is the essence of the promise he's describing here, Ray, that the Holy Spirit is working before he does anything through you to do something to you. You see, you see God doesn't want you to exercise anything down here at Foothills Elementary School today until you receive the feeling, as funky as that sounds, that you belong. God, he chooses you. He wants to hang out with Jerry. I, want, I, want, I just want to hang out. I just want to be with you. Why? Now think about this for a second. Why would God want you to go down there today and feel like you've got to go to Foothills Elementary School because Reg is making you? We're going to be keeping, Steve and I will be taking pictures to make sure who's there. If you're absent, we'll, you'll be getting a letter from the elders. You'll be required to come to a meeting. That's, I, I don't, I, don't go. That, that's the last thing I want you to do today. I would only want you to go because you're, you belong. You've experienced something that's overwhelming. It's joyful. You've been grafted in. You're full of God's promises. The Holy Spirit wants to fill you up to overflowing with God's promise, his presence. The Holy Spirit gives us these little foretastes of the full inheritance. So I know Tony knows the promise, eternal life, but the Holy Spirit is working right now and say, hey, dude, this ain't it. This is in heaven. This isn't the, this is just a charade. This is the matrix, man, and you're, you know, you're, you're living in this false reality. The real thing's coming. Let me give you just a little taste because the good stuff is about to get unleashed on you. The first thing Jesus gives us after we're saved is the Holy Spirit, this assurance you belong in relationship. Verse 13, and when you believed in Christ, he identified you. He identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. After we're saved, the Holy Spirit works to make the promise of Jesus real to us. Well, how does he do that? Well, he puts us in community. So there are a lot of reasons you come to community. You sing, you, you give, you serve. There's a lot of platforms for being in community, the church, the body of Christ. But one of the most important things for you being here today is you're together. Heaven will feel like this, not like these chairs, but you will never feel alone. You'll feel like you're connected. You, God is here. He wants you to feel like, I choose you. I want to be with you. I don't want to go to the show. I don't want to go to this other thing. I just, I, I may disagree with you. You may frustrate me, but I want to be with you. I choose you. We were made for community. We were made to be at our best when we feel the presence of God, as funky as that is, Ryan. I, I just, I want to feel presence. This is the gift Jesus promised for us, in us, through us. So in recent years, my mom has struggled with a whole bunch of different physical issues. She, um, she had her knees replaced. She had her hips replaced. I asked her one time, is there anything original left on your chassis? And so um, she can't get around without a walker, and she was raised on a farm 
which means you have stubbornness ingrained in your DNA, and she will not ride in a wheelchair. She won't even talk about a wheelchair. So she's just homebound. She can't go anywhere. Um, so her and Charlie just hang out at the house, and uh, they were perfectly happy just sitting in their brown chairs, just hanging out. And in fact, a lot of times they wouldn't have the TV on. They would just sit there. And I'm thinking, what do you talk about after you've been married 24 years and you don't ever leave the house? And I mean, it looked like there was, they were just having a blast because they were together. So on trip number one, right before trip number one, we found out that Charlie had pancreatic cancer. His time was going to be short. So um, that was one of the reasons we went down the first time. So when we got there, they, Charlie every fall has breathing problems, and so they put him in the hospital. So I went up to the hospital, and I sat with my old buddy Wes, his, his son, and we watched the Cowboys beat the Seattle Seahawks, which was a pleasurable thing to see. And so it was great. It's, it was like n no big deal. Just with Charlie, we had a big time. The next day, Amy and the kids and I, we went up to see Charlie. And the next day, that Wednesday, we drove back to Colorado. While we stayed with Mom, she'd been without Charlie for a week. And she started eating again. She wouldn't eat when Charlie wasn't there. And so while we were there, presents of her grandkids seemed to encourage her and lift her spirits. I, got, I took a picture, put it on Facebook, of Grandma sitting with Levi and Faith on this little funky booth thing that they have in the kitchen. But the sadness of separation was obvious. She wasn't with her husband. She chose him. So Charlie got moved to a rehab facility um, the day before we left. So we left on Wednesday and Thursday. Mom got to go see Charlie. She hadn't seen him in a whole week. And so she called me. I'm here in the office. And she's so excited. She just wanted to tell me she was going to get to go see her man. My mom almost never calls. It's like it's going to cost me something, you know. But she just, ha she, couldn't, she just had to share it. So Wes, my, step, my stepbrother, was going to go pick Mom up, take her to the rehab facility. And I go, okay, Mom, here's the deal. If Wes wants you to ride in a wheelchair, she goes, I'll do it. <laughs> if that's what it's going to take to go see Charlie, my mom was willing to ride in a wheelchair. Mark that down on the calendar. You weren't, you weren't made to feel alone. That's not, that's not how it's supposed to be. You, you weren't made to feel separated from God. Living, you weren't made to try to live your life without experiencing constantly the peace that comes from presence. Remember these words, John 14, 15. If you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. Never, never. John 14, 23. All who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with them. To do whatever you do every day, feeling that presence you were chosen. I just want to be with you. Ephesians 1, 13. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own. This is my boy. This is my girl. By giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised a long time ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so that we would praise and glorify him. Thursday, October the 16th. Mom got to see Charlie again in the rehab center. 
and they did the same thing they do at home. They just kind of sat in the room together. Wes was there, and he's just kind of watching him. It used to just drive me crazy. The dad would just sit there, not say anything, kind of just be there. Sometimes maybe you see older couples in a restaurant, and they're just kind of sitting, and you're thinking, how boring. Well, if you've been with someone for 40 or 50 or 60 years, sometimes you don't really have to have words to feel connected. And they were just sitting in the hospital, and mom had not left the house in a week. Charlie had not left the hospital in a week. There's only so many things to talk about. Mom was so excited to be with Charlie. And so then Wes, after a couple of hours, walked her out to her car. And when he walked back, Charlie breathed his last. It was to be their last conversation. Let me tell you something. My stepdad, Charlie, he was ready to go. The earth suit was wore out. Didn't work very well anymore. But he just needed one more touch. One more conversation. He left my mom, but he never lost his connection with God. You were not meant to be alone. You were not meant to feel alone. But do you? Do you feel this emptiness or a longing, something, this disconnect is in your heart? Do you feel God's presence? Do you feel his affection? Do you feel his love? Do you feel that sense he chose you? He just wants to be with you. Because if you don't today, before we do anything else, before you go do anything that you would give God credit for, he wants you to walk out of here today full of the promise the presence that brings peace. So, Lord, we just pray that you would guide us into the study of the Holy Spirit and that before we would participate in anything that reflects on you, help us to be full of you. I just pray that your spirit would move in us today as we get ready to go down to Foothills Elementary School, as we get ready to participate and do and enjoy whatever we're going to do this week our workplace, with our family. Pray, Lord, that you would guide us this morning to receive from you the filling of your spirit. And if this morning there are people that are here that don't know Jesus, have not put him on 